Okay, so like I was saying, welcome everybody. Um, this is our fifth uh, research seminar, I think, and I'm very happy to say that we have a speaker in person again. It's not the first time this semester, but it's still really quite special and new, and it feels exciting, and I'm happy that it worked out. As always, after this, we're going to go to the common room for a wine reception, and maybe even to a restaurant if Mary keeps her guild in the queer spontaneous. Okay, now let me see if I can give the word to Wendell, who will introduce our speaker. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, so Mary joined us in 2018, I think, um, as a PhD student, and um, she's now in the terminal stages of that process. Um, and I think the thing that I really like the most about her work is that she is working at this really cool intersection of both sociolinguistics and psycholinguistics. Come on. Um, and she's using both qualitative and quantitative methods and doing each of them with a degree of sort of careful attention and rigor that I think is really admirable. Um, so I'm really excited to see how the final thesis shapes up um, and I'm looking forward to the talk today. Thank you. Thanks, Wendell and Richard. Um, so this um, talk is about a part of my PhD that deals with accent attitudes and whether they are based on cognition or affect. Those are some attitudinal components and I'll take you through what they mean within attitudinal research. So a brief presentation outline, as you can see, the studies here, but before that I will be uh, introducing you a little bit to social psychology and how attitudes are treated there because the social psychology is the best place for attitudes uh, as a subject of research. And then we'll be going into social linguistics and how some social linguists have applied some social psychological methods in order to examine attitudes in language attitudes specifically. And then obviously we're going to get into the study itself. So the big question is, what is an attitude? And a universally kind of accepted, very vague and general definition is that it's an evaluation of an attitude object. But that kind of begs the question then, what is an evaluation? They're used interchangeably, the two terms, and that's why I'm using them in this study as well. But within social psychology, people have, researchers have come up with the, the tripartite model of attitudes, as they call it, because it's based on uh, three parts. So they're saying that attitudes or evaluations are the beliefs or thoughts, the cognition, or the emotions and feelings, the affect, or the past, present, or intended actions, the behavior towards an attitude object. Now, it can be that it's only thoughts, or only emotions, or only behaviors, or all three. Um, I'll give you some examples. So if you said something like this song is new, the word new in itself, song is the attitude object in this case, and the word new in itself uh, would be considered a cognitive evaluation in that it doesn't contain any specific emotional reactions. A person listening to a new song may think, oh, that's great, and it might cause them to be happy somehow. But the word new in itself just contains some sort of like descriptive factual thing about the attitude object. As opposed to, and I say as opposed to because this is a great mental processing binary, emotions and, and thoughts, this is a relaxing song, which contains an emotional reaction from the attitude holder. You expect that a relaxing song would make somebody feel relaxed, perhaps. Um, when it comes to behaviors, a present behavior, an example of a present behavior would be to actually listen to the song. I don't deal with behavior because behavior is a bit of a mixed bag. You have past and intended behaviors, which are mental processes. You're essentially talking about memories of behaviors or your perception of what a behavior will be in the future versus observing present behaviors that is physical actions that we're talking about. So because it's kind of mixed, a mix of physical uh, processes and mental processes, I'm not dealing with that, I'm dealing with the purely mental, as a mental process, not face, uh, the mental uh, components of attitudes. Um, so within social psychology, people, uh, researchers have look, looked at uh, various attitude objects and they've looked at whether the attitudes towards them are more cognitive or more effective or if they're both equally. Um, capital punishment, for example, attitudes towards capital punishment have been found to be more cognitive than affective. 
attitudes towards literature, microanalysis, snakes and maths, experience users from microanalysis specifically have been found to be predominantly affected. Um, church, the church and presidential candidates were found to be more uh, both cognitive and affective based. Uh, now, all these are known objects, objects that most people have heard about, have some attitude towards. Uh, but social psychologists have also looked at unknown objects or unfamiliar objects and the attitudes towards them. So examples are Chinese ideographs for participants who didn't know Chinese, or uh, a new beverage, or lemons, which were animals that the researchers came up with that don't exist. Uh, now, I have a known in, in uh, single quotations there because while lentils, yeah, it's an unknown animal, you don't know what it is, and a new beverage may be unknown, you still have attitudes towards beverages, and you still have attitudes towards animals that may resemble a lentil, let's say. So, um, I think a better word is maybe unfamiliar. Um, so, in order to examine the attitudes towards these unknown, unfamiliar objects, uh, they use priming, so they, they presented a prime stimulus to the participants. Usually it was in the form of a written message that described these attitude objects, and they expected that prime stimulus to somehow influence their evaluations of the uh, attitude object. And the way they measured those attitudes that they created and they influenced is that they used cognitive or affective adjective scales or word choices. Some examples from the cognitive side of things were useful, useless, beneficial, harmful. From the affective side of things, delightful, suddenly, relaxed, angry. So they presented written messages that described one of these objects, and then they asked them to evaluate those objects so that they can see what kind of influence those primes would have on their attitudes towards the objects. Um, I have here some examples of the prime messages for the lenthers, the, the fictitious animal, so you can see what I mean. Uh, so we have explicit, they were all explicit, obviously they had to be read by the participants. They were messages, they had to be above the level of consciousness. Uh, so they were there for a while until they read them. So the cognitive ones were more clinical, they were more factual in, in terms of what they contained, uh, what kind of information they contained about the animal. So, for example, on the positive side, you had swift, swift and graceful swimmer versus slow and ungainly swimmer. The affective messages, on the other hand, were more like personal narratives. They, they were describing how they were describing how um, a person a person's encounter with the animal, essentially. So you would have things like the animal is playing around the swimmer versus the animal is brutalizing the swimmer in the in the negative side of things. So the expectation was that if somebody was exposed to the cognitive prime, they would then choose cognitive adjectives to evaluate the object, significantly more than they would choose affective adjectives. And this is what they found. They found that the cognitive primes influenced the cognitive evaluative tasks more than the affective ones, and the same went for the affective primes. They influenced the affective tasks more than the cognitive ones. So they concluded that cognitive or affective adjectival evaluations could predict the primes that the uh, participants were exposed to, and thus could predict the basis of the attitude. Because if you remember, the primes were there in order to either condition an attitude or influence it, if there was an attitude already existent. So with a combination of primes, cognitive and affective primes and adjectives, they could indicate the basis of the attitude, essentially, towards those objects. Now, within language attitudes, there hasn't been any effective priming well, there has been affective priming, but it's not been named affective priming. So you have all these people here who were, they used emotion-inducing stimuli or primes, affective primes, and for example, white noise, and they put that white noise in the background of the accent recordings. So they had a standard accent recording and a non-standard one. And they used best of white best of white noise or continuous white noise or no white noise. So they had different conditions. Um, and or you had aggressive speech, for example. And most of these studies found that these kinds of emotions that they prompted in the participants were in fact significantly influential in the evaluation uh, uh, of, of the uh, accents that those participants provided. So most of them conclude that affect does in fact play a role in accent attitude formation. 
Um, cognition, on the other hand, has not been operationalized in within social linguistics for language attitude um, examination. And of course, if it's not been operationalized, it's never been contrasted to cognition, to mm -hmm. ethic rather, which is where my study comes in. There has been in the 90s, there has been a, a theoretical discussion on so uh, Kajal and colleagues took the tripartite model and tried to apply it to language attitudes. So they said, what kind of attitudes is it affective attitudes, is it cognitive, behavioral? Uh, what do we have in, in language in the linguistic domain? What they said was, what they theorized was that um, affect may be uh, attitudes, language attitudes may be entirely affective in nature. So they said, as an example, they, they talked about somebody that doesn't know a language. And if they don't know a language, they don't have, they said, they don't have any thoughts, factual thoughts about that language. They don't have any knowledge about that language. However, they said they, ha they will have an emotional response to it. This is what they theorized. And they said also that thoughts about a language rarely occur without the presence of feelings. So they gave, theoretically, they didn't experiment on that, but they gave a kind of affective primacy when it comes to language attitudes, not cognitive primacy. So that affect plays a more important role. So beside the kind of like experimental priming that I've presented so far, within social linguistics and in social psychology, people have spoken about social conditioning and social priming. Again, it's nothing called priming, but this is what it is. So in the, in the 70s, uh, Giles and colleagues proved the imposed norm hypothesis. So found evidence rather uh, for the imposed norm hypothesis. Um, so they exposed British participants to two varieties of Greek. It was Athenian Greek, which is supposedly the standard variety, and Grecian Greek, supposedly a non-standard variety. And they didn't find any differences in how they evaluated the varieties. So that supported the fact that there are no innate language features that people respond to when they evaluate uh, varieties, language varieties, facts and varieties. And it is instead um, social norms that condition their attitudes. Um, in theoretical discussions as well, there have been a lot of public domains that have been thematized as conduits of acts and attitudinal discourse. You have newspaper discourse, metalinguistic discourse, and I'll show you some examples of that. You have the TV and radio as well, as well as education. So according to some uh, social linguists, these domains circulate acts and attitudinal discourse or language attitudinal discourse as well. Um, and that this was gets produced and reproduced by the public, and then it's fed back into the media essentially. So there's a circulation of discourse internalized by many members of the public as well. Um, and also within social psychology, specifically with, when it comes to not just generally language attitudes but cognitive and affective attitudes, specifically, uh, Simons and Carey, two social psycholinguists, have spoken about how cognitive attitudes are more, they're both, first of all, contextually sourced and that the cognitive attitudes, cognitive attitudes are come from the school and the media mostly, which aligns very well with this. Whereas affective attitudes come from more immediate environments, more personal experiences, they say. So this is an example of some examples of um, newspaper discourse. As you can see, there are British newspapers, Guardian, Telegraph, etc. etc. And each one of them refers to acts and attitudes, essentially. This is direct acts and attitudes. They're talking about how Romy accents are Western staying silent. Romy accents are more guilty. Scousers have the least intelligent and least trustworthy accent. And does your accent make you sound smarter? All of them contain acts and attitudinal discourse. They are somehow evaluating accents, whether directly or not, they're evaluating them. Uh, I'm, I'm bringing this up. I don't have like, a, I'm not collecting a corpus of this or anything. I'm, just bringing this up as an example of newspaper discourse that does exactly what I mentioned before. And also to show you some like discursive pattern where if you look at these two um, articles, these two titles, they are uh, reporting on the same study. But notice how different the way they're expressing themselves is. First of all, both of them are using single quotations. That happens here as well to show that they're reporting on, on an opinion, right? They're also using this kind of little tag here to maybe add some ethos to their stuff, make it a bit more scientific. Um, but notice how this one has omitted the verb, and you would expect the verb to be the popular verb, right? So from the accents are less than staying silent, you would expect it would be the full sentence perhaps, whereas here is perceived 
I would say so big big difference perhaps not something that would be evident uh, directly but it's still there it is a big difference and they are recording on the same content uh, I'll come back to uh, these towards the end uh, another thing that I want to say is that each one of these contains affective and cognitive affective or cognitive lexicon so for example intelligent is a cognitive word this is cognitive this is affective um, so these not only show the social linguistic aspect of things but they're, only, they're also showing how social psychology works here, attitudinal social psychology. By the way, I'm not being arbitrarily choosing these as cognitive and affective. There is an evaluative lexicon, it's a database of, of words. It was created by social uh, psychologists in 2015, I think, and it contains uh, cognitive and affective scores for each word. So some words are more cognitive, others are more affective. Uh, and also it contains the valence of how positive and negative words are. Um, so, to get to the study, um, I wanted to combine experimental techniques, priming techniques from social psychology and social linguistics. So, the prime messages that I showed you, for example, and the evaluative adjectives, as well as some elements of the social priming discussions that I just presented in order to examine how much cognition and affect play a role in the formation of attitudes towards six English, English accents and other uh, then through all of that. So my hypothesis where this hypothesis has to do with the evaluative adjectives. I expected that some cognitive adjectives would affect some accent attitudes while the affective adjectives would uh, influence different accent attitudes. The same thing with the prime messages. I expected that it wouldn't be the same prime message that's in the cognitive prime message that would affect every accent attitude. As a combination of the, of the two hypotheses, I expected that the way the adjectives, the adjectival components of cognition and affect would influence uh, the accent attitudes, it would be the same as the primes. So that if a cognitive prime affected an accent attitude, it would also be a cognitive adjective that was influencing the same accent attitude. So that there would be an agreement between the way cognition and affect through the adjectives and the primes were influencing the accents, the accent attitude. So the participants, the people that were exposed to the primes, that were exposed to the accent recordings and, and to the adjectives, were 47 speakers of English, born and raised in England, 1830, students here, yeah, not linguistic students. Um, and these three were prerequisites, so people had to be that to participate. These three came after. I asked them about this in the experiment, and they were also entered in the regression model. Um, so you can see the gender and the region are quite self-explanatory. Accent, I have 13 people with a North English accent, sorry, 19 people with a North English 30 with a South English, and then 7 standard and 8 standard, and I'll explain this too. So in this study, in the way that I'm, the way that I'm using the word standard, I'm including things like things that people have said in a pilot study, and also uh, social linguists have discussed things like portions, things like accent absence. Things like wealth, things like middle classness, correctness. Um, and in terms of standardish, so people that are reported on these things were termed, were coded as standard, standard speaking, and then standardish. Um, so there were some people, those eight people, they would say things like, I have a received pronunciation with a little bit of maturity, or I have a posh accent with a little bit of Liverpoolian. This is why I put standard-ish. They gave more privacy to the standard part of their accent rather than the not standard. Whether that was accurate or not, I don't know. I, I was asking for their, uh, it was their own evaluation of their own accent. Um, I did not use the term near standard, which would have been more conventional, because to me that term is like, it is connoting this kind of uh, goal for the standard, that the end goal is the standard, and it's not something that I want to endorse here at all. Uh, that's why I'm using standardish. Um, so the experimental structure. You would start with one prime, one of these four primes. So you have a cognitive positive or a cognitive negative or an affective positive or an affective negative prime. That would be followed by one of these accents in the form of recordings. Again, the standard accent, similar to what I just said, it was an accent where in the pilot they said things like, oh, this is posh, oh, that speaker is middle class, etc., etc. And then you would have six adjectives. Uh, those adjectives came both from a pilot study as well as the evaluative lexicon that I've mentioned 
before. I wanted a kind of like nice balance of midpoint, two affective and two cognitive adjectives, adjectival skills. In terms of the accents, by the way, uh, there were six accents in the way that I quoted them. I paired them, but there were 12 speakers. So I had two speakers per accent. I didn't do any uh, match guys technique. So I had two speakers per accent, both because I wanted to kind of merge any intra speaker variation. And then I, I coded them in, in pairs to make with the regression model easier as well. But I did use speaker as a random variable in the regression model, just in case there was any intra variation. Uh, things happening, interesting things happening. So the primes, to start with the first thing, um, these are two primes, this is the cognitive positive and this is the affective positive, and everything you see in square brackets is the negative counterpart, and we'll go through each one, I'll make it a little bit easier for you, I hope you can see the blue bits. So anything that's orange is cognition, anything that's blue is affect, and the yellow bits uh, the indirect accent attitudes, and I'll take you through it. So I'll read out the first few lines of the cognitive. Uh, prime flawless is how 20% of the interviews describe telephone interviews with candidates from particular places in the UK, a study shows. As opposed to, if you read the first line here, terrific or insufferable in the negative. Prime is how the interview describes the personal experience of telephone interviews with candidates from particular places in the UK. So I'm sure you can already see a difference, and it's coming from social psychology. The, the cognitive prime is more clinical, more factual, it contains scientific results, supposedly. They're fake, they're made up. And the affective one is more personal. It's, it's describing a personal experience. The interviewer's personal experience with interviews. Now, uh, the accent attitudinal part of it is indirect. I chose it because I chose for it to be indirect because I expected from previous studies as well, I expected that in a study where I'm using priming in order to influence attitudes, if people understood the purpose of the primes, they may not have been as effective. That comes from studies in social psychology that say that when people realize when they're at, where their attitudes are coming from, they're more likely to resist them. That's why I went for as much of an indirect accent attitudinal discourse as I could. So I chose telephone interviews, I regionalized it as well, particular places in the UK. And finally, I also used things like study shows, which comes from the newspaper articles that I showed you, a little tag at the end of the sentence. I used quotation marks, again, coming uh, influenced by the uh, newspaper discourse that I showed you. Um, all the words in quotation marks, here and here and then to here, are also from the evaluative lexicon. So they've been scored affective or cognitive and they were used as such. Um, so after the primes, the participants were exposed to the recordings and then after that to the adjective scales. So the recordings, the speaker were female, they were 18 to 30, and they were University of Manchester students as well. And the content of the recording was one side of the telephone conversation. So the listeners were told that you're standing there and somebody's on the phone next to you. So they could hear what that somebody was saying, which gave me quite a lot of freedom with what I could put in there, because it could have been as incoherent as I wanted it in a way. It didn't have to be coherent, because they knew that it's a, it's a one side of a telephone conversation. I also, this is an excerpt from the end of it, did you hear the news? Yeah, it won't last long, I said yesterday I for doing our meal. I also could, um, I also did not want to give a lot of information as to what, what the speaker's status is, so what their profession is and stuff, because uh, there have been studies that have shown that the more, some, the least somebody know, the, uh, the fewer details somebody knows about the speaker of an accent, the more they're going to focus on the linguistic part of it, the accent itself. Um, after the recordings, after each of the recordings, you have the uh, evaluative scales. So as I said, we have two cognitive adjectives, two midpoint and two affective ones. You find them gentle, friendly, comfortable, calm, and happy. They also came from a pilot study, in, as I said before, in combination with the invited lexicon scores. Um, the labels were of the scales not, let's say, happy, happy. I didn't go with unhappy, happy, because why not that and not sad, happy? So I just chose something that made it easier for me to just keep the original form of the, uh, of the adjective and just add the word not next to it. Uh, consistency, as well as the fact that Unhappy and happy have different 
um, emotionality scores in the evaluated lexicon, they, they wouldn't be carrying the same, the exact same scores. Um, so to recap, these were my independent variables for primes, speaker accents, divided adjectives. My dependent one was the numerical evaluation, six points, and I also had the speakers as a random variable, like I said before. Um, so these are the results, the significant results of the analysis of variance, and these are the ones we're going to focus on, the yellow ones. So there were three-way interactions with prime, which was great. And there was a two-way interaction with adjective. Adjective was not found to significantly interact with prime. Um, we're focusing on these and not main effects because my, my opinion on this is that if there's interaction, you focus on the interaction. I know that literature disagrees on that. Um, there were also things like prime and list agenda, which is interesting, but upon examination, the only thing that happened there was that some of the gender groups, so the female participants, uh, were uh, providing higher evaluations after the cognitive positive prime than after the cognitive negative prime. So there it was just a valence, something expected that the positive prime would prompt higher evaluations than the negative prime. Um, there were also things here like speaker accent and this agenda, which is interesting, just not with this study. I'm focusing on anything that has to do with adjective and prime, anything that interacted with these two. Um, so the first interaction, adjective and speaker accent, the hypothesis that was related to that was had to do with how the adjectives are going to influence the accent attitudes, the evaluations, uh, differentially hypothesized. The influence, by the way, of the adjectives was measured by highest ratings. Prime was not involved in this, so there was no positive or negative or anything like that. Each of the scales, if you remember, the valences were positive, all the adjectives had positive valences. Um, so if the effective adjective prompted higher, significantly higher results than the cognitive adjective, then the affective was deemed to be the more influential. And the same goes for the cognitive. If the cognitive prime uh, was uh, prompting higher results than the effective, then the cognitive would be more influential. So hypothesis one was supported, and I'll take you through this. Here we have the speaker accents. We have cognitive and affective adjectives here. The midpoint, there was no nothing significant found, and so I'm just including significant differences here. And here we have the predicted mean values. I'm using the regression models that's predicted, not raw means. Um, so with Birmingham, Liverpool, London, Manchester, and Newcastle, we see that calm and happy, in, in some cases both, some cases just calm, are significantly higher than one of the uh, uh, cognitive adjectives. So more influential, whereas with the standard, we see the opposite. Expectedly, I think, refined was higher the, for the standard. It's more of a status-based, I suppose, adjective. And so uh, there was uh, the, the opposite result here. So the cognitive adjective was a bit more influential, significantly rather, not just a bit more, significantly more influential than the effective one. And this is a table representation of what you just saw. So we have from Birmingham to Newcastle, we have this affective pattern, whereas the standard goes with the cognitive. Hypothesis one was seen to be supported because it was different um, components, attitudinal components that were affecting each of the, uh, there was a difference between some of them at least. Um, the second hypothesis had to do with the primes and how they influence the adjectives here. The influence of the uh, primes was measured within valence so you had a cognitive positive prime that was prompting significantly higher results or evaluations than the effective positive prime, then the cognitive positive would be more influential. Again, you're expecting that a positive prime would prompt higher ratings, and that was in fact the case. I'm just not mentioning it here. And then the cognitive negative prime, if it prompted significantly higher than the effective negative, then the effective negative would be more influential because, again, you expect that the negative would prompt lower than the positive. Um, so these are the results for the positive part of things. So you have the cognitive positive prime and the effective positive prime. You have the speaker accents here. Nothing significant here, that's why it's empty. You have, again, the means. And here, the only difference is, because this is a three-way interaction, you also have the listener accents. So you can see that for Birmingham and for London, amongst the same accent group, standardish, and for Manchester, amongst the North English accent group, 
it is the effective force to find that is more influential, significantly more influential. These are only significant results. With Liverpool and Standard, it's the opposite. Uh, with Standard, we have the South English and Standard is actually acting the group, and then Liverpool, South English A and Standard is acting the group, which are which were affected in, in their evaluations towards the standard in the Liverpool by the cognitive prime more than the effective prime. Um, with regards to the negative uh, groups now, the negative primes, I don't have a figure because it was literally just two significant interactions here. Um, so you see blue, I think a color prime is enough now to, to associate affect with blue and cognition perhaps with orange. Um, so the Birmingham speaker accent was more affected by the effective prime amongst people that were South English accented. And then the Newcastle speaker accent attitude was affected more by the effective prime, again, uh, amongst uh, Standish accented uh, listeners. So it seems that so far at least, there is a distinction between, and I'll show you a table representation of what you just saw. So you can see that Birmingham, the Birmingham accent amongst these listeners groups, we have the effective prime playing a role, the effective uh, component. With London, it's the same, and Manchester and Newcastle, whereas with Liverpool and Standard, you have the quality playing a, a more important role and more, a significant influence. Um, so with the other, I think that's obscured by that, here there it says listener region, so it's the other uh, interaction, the last interaction that we saw. So here you have the Manchester speaker accent being affected more than the affected uh, by the affected prime, uh, the standard speaker accent attitude by the cognitive prime, and then the Manchester for the negative side of things, you have the affected prime amongst these three uh, groups, regional groups of listeners. And again, I'll show you a presentation of this. Again, Manchester affected, affected amongst these groups, and then standard cognitive amongst the North English group. Um, it seems to be supported, this hypothesis as well, because attitudes are in fact influenced differentially by the primes. You have this connection here, but you have this connection here, and what well, I showed before as well. The third hypothesis had to do with whether the adjective evaluation, sorry, the adjective influence and the prime influence agree with one another. So here are all the tables that I was showing you before. This is uh, this is empty because there, are, there were no significant interactions there, and these are all the significant interactions that we looked at. So the adjective speaker accent, prime speaker accent, listener accent, and the prime speaker accent listener region is right there. And I will call code this for you. Hope that helps. Again, anything orange, cognitive, anything blue, affect. So I want to start with. By the way, each table is sorted by speaker accent, so they're all in order by speaker accent. I want to start with Manchester, with speaker accent, and, and then Sandler as well. You can see that across all interactions, it is affected by affect, more than cognition. Affective adjective, affective prime, affective prime, affective prime again. The same goes with standard, but for cognition, cognitive prime, cognitive prime, cognitive adjective. So there is a consistency across conditions. You can also see consistency here, Newcastle, London, and Birmingham. There is an inconsistency with Liverpool. So Liverpool seems to be affected more by the cognitive prime, but by the affective adjective. While the inconsistency is recognized, of course, I'm arguing that there is a, an affective tendency because, like Newcastle, it was both affective adjectives that were significantly more influential than one cognitive adjective, whereas with regards to the primes, it was only the cognitive positive prime that was more influential than the affective positive prime. The cognitive negative prime, we didn't have any significances. So I'm saying that obviously there is an inconsistency, but I think that there is an affective tendency still. Um, so for the most part, this hypothesis is supported. There is agreement with a little asterisk for Liverpool. There is agreement between uh, the, the way the adjective components influence the accent attitudes and the prime components did as well. So the question for me here was whether there's any distinguishable features across the accents that 
would account for this kind of differentiation in the data, the cognition and affect differentiation. I'm arguing that there is, but it has to do with standardness. So, and still I'm recognizing the, the uh, inconsistency here. You can see that from the Birmingham to the Newcastle acts and attitudes, affect is playing the biggest role. Whereas with the standard acts and attitudes, those that were deemed standard by the participant for this, um, it, it was cognition that played a role across adjectives and primes, across conditions. So this kind of image of more affect, less cognition, kind of supports Kajal and Politis uh, theoretical statement that I mentioned at the start, that there is an affective primacy when it comes to acts and attitudes. They said that acts and attitudes seem to be more affected in nature. Of course, it has to be acknowledged that this is a specific sample, right? This is only six accents. If more accents were added to the mix, perhaps cognition would somehow flare up. I don't know. Um, it also seems to support Dragovich and Giles' finding that uh, that was the study with the white noise that I said that they had a standard accent and a non standard accent and they added white noise. And they found that what they found was that that affect inducing uh, stimulus played a role, but only for the non-standard accents, whereas for the standard one it did not, which kind of agrees with this. It is the affective component that's playing a role, not the cognitive component when it comes to the non-standard accent attitudes. Of course, there are also studies that found that the affective, the affect inducing stimuli that they use played a role across standard and non-standard varieties. Again, it needs to be recognized that there is a specific, this is a specific sample, it's limited. It might be also that the fact that cognition is present uh, accounts for some of the differences in the data uh, with the differences of those uh, researchers, of those studies. I also want to bring back uh, the theoretical discussions on the media and education being uh, conduits of acts and attitudinal discourse. Uh, so within education, at least in the UK social linguistics case, we know but that standard acts and attitudes are praised, they're endorsed, enforced, one could say as well, and whereas non-standard accents and language generally is vilified, it is rejected, it is absent. And this kind of, the, the culture of education, the discourse of education is based on supposed facts. It's, it's a fact that language, some language forms are correct. It is perceived as a fact at least, or is treated as a fact, which, I see reflected a little bit in my data. The factual base, the knowledge based attitudes are the ones related to the standard accent, whereas the more emotional based attitudes are related to the non standard accents. I also added, I think last week this study came out of Rapu and Cooper. So they, they went to Liverpool schools and they asked about Scouse English. And they first examined the use of Scouse English and then they asked whether people use Scouse English, and they asked both um, teachers and students. And they found that none of the participants said that they use or want to use Scouse English, that they were all using standard English. And okay, that, that was expected. And again, it agrees with what I also found. But what to me was very, very interesting is that they found that um, the opinion that I'm not going to use Scouse English because standard English is amazing for education or whatever was never questioned. So neither the, the students nor the teachers questioned it or challenged it. So they didn't say things like, I don't use Scouse English because I know it's, it's not my way to success, but I would like to. There was none of that. And they also didn't find teachers talking about the struggle of students that do not have the privilege of having the standard accent and go to school and use it. Um, so I think that also is relatable here because this kind of unquestionable fact-like attitude towards the use of the standard, I think, relates to this connection between cognition and standard acts and attitudes. Uh, I also want to just bring you back to the articles that I showed you before, knowing now all the things I've told you about my study, um, and again, kind of argue that while it might not be an exact and direct support of the fact that these things influence individual acts and attitudes, the fact that they all contain acts and attitudinal discourse as well as affective and cognitive discourse similar to my primes lends some support to the fact, to the theories that one 
such mass media uh, to talk about how such media is affecting individual axiom attitudes. Uh, to conclude, so to conclude, um, the study found that it was predominantly cognitive standard axiom attitudes, but predominantly affected non-standard axiom attitudes. I also made some connections with some public domains that have been said to influence individual axiom attitudes, axiom ideology generally, education, newspapers. I didn't use any other mass medium, although people like Copeland, for example, are talking about the radio and television. It's just a, uh, I just chose as an example of mass media newspapers. Um, there were limitations to the study, of course. So the accent sample was not huge, first of all. Then I would also like to see what would happen if all the accents were standard. So if I had only standard speakers, I'm wondering if it would be a cognition fest or if the fact that there are no uh, non-standard speakers would change something in the way the, the primes uh, would be influencing and the adjectives would be influencing uh, the data, the admissions. Um, in, I would also like to see what would happen if the primes were direct, so if they were talking directly about accent attitudes. Uh, and how that would influence the results. So I think generally cognition and attitude should be examined in, with regards to how they influence action attitudes, because knowing the form of an attitude, the structure of an attitude, I think, can enable us to, well, knowing the structure of an attitude is great for knowledge sake within academia, but it can also speak to accentist attitudes. What I mentioned when it comes to schools, when it comes to education that does that you know one, one type of attitude, they do not want one type of accent, they only want the correct type of accent, um, is an accentist, standardist attitude. And I do think that knowing the form of accent attitudes can help us possibly address the issue, possibly challenge it. Uh, I'll leave you to that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mary. It was really, really interesting. Like I said in the beginning, it's really interesting intersection between sociolinguistics, accents, and psycholinguistic stuff, uh, cognition, and effect, and um, all this methodology. Pretty cool. Um, so we go to questions, and we start with people in the room. Yeah, let's see what, if there's anybody here who would like to ask a question, maybe. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I did just. Um, I found it really interesting when, um, so on the, when you had the two paragraphs that were the primes. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to go back to them? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so like one, one of them was for um, cognitive and one of them was for affective. And I was interested to see that one of the, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah so one of the, um, adjectives that was used to prime for cog uh, cognition um, the, the negative one is uninteresting yeah and I, I kind of I, I was thinking about just whether I obviously I don't know the literature or, or like anything about cognition and effect really but that kind of strikes me as more like effect just to just um, that, that it would, yeah, it would prompt the emotion so yeah. in this case I just went to develop lexicon so yeah, we can yeah. score that as cognition as cognitive so I went with that right. but I can see what you mean in terms of perhaps the semantics of it mm. semantics of it but yeah I just went with the scores that I was given there thought this is my database these are the, the way I can operationalize these words yeah. what is this lexical database environmental lexicon is called 2.0 and it was made by Rockwood and Fazio in, in 2015 they gathered uh, reviews online from Amazon, Amazon Tech, and they gathered TV scripts, and then they gave them to like 300 participants in their school, somewhere in the US, and in the university, and they asked them to rate their emotionality, cognitive, affective, and all that, from zero to nine, and their valence. So it was made uh, from participants in social psychology. It will be human participants that are used, uh, but yeah, that, that is how they created this. The adjectives have a different connotation when they're used in movies than when they're used in accents. They didn't only have movies, they, so that, that's why they tried to get reviews from a lot of things. But yeah, it's likely the semantics, they didn't look at the semantics, they just looked at what the participants gave them in terms of scoring the cognition and the affect of it. Of each of the words, it's a bit more than 1500 words. 
Very good. Uh, any other questions? I was sort of wondering about what you said at the end of the study, whether one can actually make any change. And the problem is right, that people have this on their belief side rather than just the emotional side, and they really believe that there's a correct form and the only correct form. Yeah. And on the other hand, if you try to change that by saying that there's person A and person B, and person A is standard and person B doesn't, and they both have the same intelligence, whatever, we can demonstrate that. But still, people see all around them that people speaking the standard actually do get on their pen drives. So how do you change their beliefs? And, and then it reinforces what they believe when exactly. they see success. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know if that's a question, but I'll, I'll still comment on it. I am constructing my final paper now, where I'm trying to talk a little bit more towards the, speak to the, the more, what can we do perhaps about it. I have like two topics in mind. One has to do with how accentism is seen. It is not seen as a legal form of discrimination. We know this, it is not in the Equality Act. And people have, that's not my, my uh, opinion, that Bill has spoken about this in, in the early 2000s. Kinsler spoke about this last year. It is not an accepted legal, uh, illegal form of discrimination. It is not in the Equality Act. So I think maybe changing people's opinion through that, and also something I'm trying to argue is that accent is a social construct. It's a construct that needs to be seen as such. It is not something innate. It is not something. It's just. It's not just sound. It, it's things that that are related to social features. So maybe these two topics work together, perhaps changing how accentism is seen in in the law, and also how accent as a concept is seen in society. Maybe it can lead to something. That's, that's all I have for now. Should we see if there are questions yeah, on sure. the vote? Doesn't seem to be the case. Well, that's good for me because then I can ask questions. So much. <laughs> yeah. to ask them so much. Uh, I think the results, unfortunately, were a bit fast for me. I mean, I put them, just went through it. I'm not sure I understood everything. But could you just maybe go back to table two? So talk me through again the um, y axis predicted me. I thought, because what I thought was that my independent variable in a sense is my prime, and then the adjectives that people evaluated, that's the outcome. The, so the, how 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 useful was what was the adjectives again? And refined, it was refined, refined and gentle, and, and then uh, comfortable and calm and okay. And it was a scale, so yeah. it was yeah. a for the very refined, yeah, not refined. Yeah, so, the, so I thought that's what I see here. Mm -hmm. So here you don't see the adjectives anyway, but you, you told me the primes with the adjectives and the primes did not interact. So it's uh, you see the primes and then the accents, the speaker accents, yeah. and then the, the listener accents. Yeah. And that's it. It's the previous table that has the adjectives. That and what is, what is the outcome? Oh, here it's the, the six points in the scale. So from uh, one to six. So there was six point divided by scales. So the outcome is the the, the numbers. I'm not sure. The meaning was, was that not the adjectives. The, the adjectives were the labels, and they affected them either cognitively or uh, affectively, but they affected the evaluations. But then the the scales were numerical. So this is what I was counting the the mean of the scales, not the adjectives. It's not the adjectives in this case because I'm taking I'm taking the numericals to be affected by the primes. And the speaker accents and the listener yeah, accents. I get, the the I get the primes, speaker accent, listener yeah. accent, all three. I just don't really understand what, what the outcome is. Um, it's the. This is the sum of what you The mean, the mean value. But you had, you had, mean you had different mean. adjectives. No, it was the same adjectives. It's just the adjectives did not interact with these three, so I didn't, I didn't include them in this analysis. So, what were these adjectives again? Refined, Refined. gentle, gentle. Comfortable. Then the, the midpoint was comfortable and. Uh, comfortable and friendly, and then calm and happy. Those oh, and each yeah. one of those had the numericals. So it was the numericals that are here. They don't have to do with the answer. So this is a not overall sort of overall. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. In this case. And is that is that possibly problematic? In, in what sense? sense? In what sense? I just uh, uh, 
This, so this lumps together my like positive attitude from gentleness as well as comfortableness. So mm -hmm. it's all in one score. It would be, yeah, it would be. So in the regression, I look at the difference between the difference between the positive primes, in this case, the positive and effective positive primes, without thinking of attitude in this case, because there was no significant interaction. So yeah, it would be lumped together like this. Because a previous study, study, some previous studies precisely looked at different kinds of evaluations, like when they say drummy sounds better than science, mm -hmm. or more intelligent or whatever, mm -hmm. whereas this is just sort of positive attitudes or something like this. Yeah, for Overall this, positive. for this, it would be the positive, yeah, for, for this particular interaction, but then when I looked at the attitudes, it, it was each adjective specifically in the previous figure, for example, because it was the adjective interacting with the speaker accent, if that makes sense. It is difficult. I have to wrap my head around it. I just hope this actually makes all perfect sense because for me it was a good class and I was worried. Fair enough. Also, with uh, the different um, listener accents here, mm -hmm. I mean, the 47 people and then one, two, three, four different classes. Yeah, instead of like two, let's say. Yeah, or maybe even just control each other super rigorously so they all have exactly the so same. So I was hoping that the regression model would converge with these four and it did. So that was great. But if it hadn't, yeah, I would have, I would have either grouped them in two perhaps and lost some of the data or controlled for them. But since it, it converged to these four groups, I, I went with it. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is now, so it's all good. <laughs> but I just hope not expect enough power. And yeah. Also I, as as powerful as I could make it in terms of I did compare different regression models, this seemed to be the, the most powerful one. Well, of course. Okay, that makes much more sense. Then thanks to everybody for coming. Thanks to everybody on Zoom for tuning in. Uh, thanks for you guys uh, for showing up in person. And we will now head over for some wine. Right, thank you.